do Christians worship three gods? The reason that some may ask this question is because we believe in the triune God, or we believe in what's called the Trinity. And I want to say this at the very beginning, that although, you know, I will paint a path through scripture to help us understand our conclusion that we believe in a triune God, um, even the greatest theologians throughout all of history have fallen short as it uh, relates to really comprehending in the full scope the Trinitarian God, what the Trinity means and, and all of the nuances. Uh, it's a thing that we will probably never fully understand uh, this side of heaven and maybe even in heaven we won't fully understand because God is so unique and other than what we are. But we're here, we're given scripture, and we are explained, we, we are, it is explained through scripture who God is and uh, the composite nature of who God is, and we are left to think these things through prayerfully and rationalize and come to conclusions as God has laid it out for us. And so tonight I want to talk about this idea of the Trinity. Um, at the very beginning, I want to say this, the conclusion is no, Christians do not worship three gods. We believe that there is one God. He is eternally existent in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that emphatically. A few years ago, uh, my wife and I and, and several from our church family, we visited uh, Israel and we spent a little over a week there. And what you notice, one of the many things that you notice as you're walking through, especially the city gates of Jerusalem or uh, businesses or homes, any place that you find a doorway and people who live inside who observe or observe the Jewish religion, um, they have these little, um, these little docket things. They call them mezuzahs. And basically what this is, is it's um, a little plaque that is, that is, you know, nailed to a doorway, whether it be a front door or an interior door or whatever the case is. And basically what happens is they take portions of scripture, primarily from Deuteronomy chapter 6, and they put it inside of this little capsule and they put it over their doorpost. This is um, the chapter where the Lord speaks to the people of Israel and he explains who he is and he says, now I want you to take this and write it above your doorpost and you know put it in places where you can see it. And when you're walking down the road with your children, explain these things to them. This is where the concept of the mezuzah comes from. Well, in Deuteronomy chapter six, one of the things that God says about himself that is included in most mezuzahs is this statement. He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And those who would um, kind of bake, uh, base an argument against the Trinitarian God would use a verse like this to say, well, there, there is only one God, but you say there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in which we as Christians would reply, that's correct. We believe that there is only one God. We do not believe that there are three gods, but there is one God. There is one being that is representative in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's interesting when you begin looking into the text, um, when scripture says the Lord, uh, our God, the Lord is one, the phrase that's used there in the Hebrew, um, it doesn't necessarily speak to the singularity of God being one as we would think in a singular thing, okay? Now, I believe that's that's, emphasized, I believe God is saying that, but what the word actually means is it's speaking to the idea of unity. So it is speaking to singularity, but it's also speaking to unity. Now, we find the same Hebrew word in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, where God is talking about a husband and a wife, and when they become one flesh, he isn't saying that the individual people fade away, but what he is saying is that there is now a unity between these two. They are bound together. They are interwoven together. And so this scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 6, although many would 
point to it and say, well, this eliminates, you know, Jesus as the son or, you know, the Holy Spirit as God. Um, No, quite the contrary. This actually speaks to the idea of the Godhead being in complete and utter unity with one another. We believe that the Trinity is one divine being without separation or division. Again, there's unity among, yet with different functions as three distinct persons. And so tonight what we're going to do is we're going to walk through um, a lot of scripture that help us understand more fully uh, the concept of the Trinitarian God. To do that, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about eight things that I think every Christian believer should know and, and have a grip on as it relates to the triune God. So number one in your notes, uh, the notes say this, the Trinity, and this is so huge, so very important for us to understand at the very beginning, the Trinity is complex. And what I mean by that is understanding the Trinity uh, is complex. I would even say to some degree, it's impossible to fully understand uh, the Trinity and to be able to explain it. It was once said, that to try to explain the Trinity, you can lose your mind. But if you try to deny the Trinity, you'll lose your soul. I believe it was St. Augustine who said that um, Trinity is the Christian name for God. In other words, we don't believe that there are three individual gods that we worship, but we believe that the Christian faith is comprised of one being, one God, who is represented in Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three different people. So there's a complexity there. And so throughout Christian history, what theologians and teachers have attempted to do is they have tried to explain the Trinity in terms that the average person can understand. And while I think some of these are very helpful for us, I think that it's a real slippery slope as it relates to uh, using illustrations to explain God. Okay, and I want to I want to give you a couple of examples. Gregory of uh, Nyssa he once said that the Trinity is kind of like the rainbow in that there is one beam, but there are many colors in the rainbow. And so he was saying that the Trinitarian God is, you know, there is one God with three different persons within the Godhead. St. Patrick uh, once said that um, uh, it's kind of like a a clover. There is a a single leaf, but there are three elements of that clover. Um, Another illustration is that of a spring, uh, a fount, and then a stream, Um, Although they are they are distinguishable, they're they're unified. They're they're part of the same body of water. Um, there are others that would relate uh, and say that the Trinity can be understood kind of like time can be understood. That there's a past, a present, and a future, but they're all considered time. Now, again, I I want to I want to make this very very clear. Uh, some people would would classify me as teaching heresy even to mention those illustrations. Um, But I do think that some illustrations can help us understand the nature of the Trinity, but every illustration will ultimately fall short. There's never going to be an illustration that just absolutely pegs and gives us an understanding of what the Trinity is because God is so other. God is so different. And, you know, you've heard pastors say before that uh, the scripture, declare, God de- declares, he says, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And it's not just that God has higher thoughts than we have. It's that God is on a com- in a completely different realm as it relates to his higherness and his otherness. And so for us to be able to truly understand God who is infinite and we are finite, um, that's a that's a tall task. That's a big order, and I don't know that any human has actually ever been able to fully understand and to fully comprehend. Um, Martin Luther made this phenomenal uh, concluding statement as he had you know written on on the idea the the concept of the Trinity. This is what he said. He said, since the Trinity is based on clear Scripture, reason or our intellect must be silent 
and we must simply believe. What Luther was saying there, he wasn't saying we shouldn't you know, uh, um, use our cognitive abilities to attempt to understand the Trinity or to understand the Lord. But what he was saying is this, he's saying at some point you're gonna fall short. At some point your understanding is gonna hit a wall But because the Trinitarian God is based clearly in scripture, there comes a point when you hit that wall, you just got to take the step of faith and you just got to believe. We must come to a place where we just simply believe because it's written in scripture. So uh, to, to get out of the gates here, the Trinity is a very complex thing to understand, okay? Number two, I think every Christian should understand this about the Trinity, that the Trinity is a scriptural reality, okay? Uh, The triune God in your notes is not only seen in the Old Testament, which we'll talk about in a few moments, but the triune Godhead is seen in the Old Testament as well. In the opening verses of the book of Genesis, listen to what scripture says. In the beginning, God, which is the Father, created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep. And then God said, so this is what John, the apostle would call Jesus is the word of God. So here in this moment, you see the triune Godhead. Then God spoke, let there be light. And there was light. So this is where John says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. But this is what he says, the word was God. And contextually there, he's talking about Jesus, the son of God. And so even from the, from the opening verses of Genesis, we see this triune nature of who God is. Throughout Genesis 1, uh, we see the word in Hebrew, it's the word Elohim, which is used. And oftentimes when that's used here in this portion of scripture, it's the plural word for God. And so you have God, the Father who's creating, Jesus Christ, the word of God is speaking, and the spirit of God is hovering, but they are one being. They, They are unified and inseparable, okay? In the book of Isaiah, the prophet wrote this as he was uh, for uh, he was he was predicting the the coming of Messiah. This is how he this is the language he would use. He would say, "For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be fought, called." wonderful counselor, which is the Holy Spirit. Jesus said there will be another teacher. There will be another comforter. There will be another counselor that comes when he was speaking of the Holy Spirit. So he will be called wonderful counselor. He will be called mighty God. He will be called everlasting father, which is God, the father and the prince of peace, which is the son of God, Jesus. So here in Isaiah's prophecy, he is speaking to the Trinitarian God. It's a phenomenal thing when you begin to read through scripture and you begin to see where God is revealing himself in this way. Uh, it's really an eye-opening thing to experience. Throughout the rest of the Old Testament, we see glimpses. Uh, for instance, in uh, the book of Numbers, uh, many of us are, are familiar with uh, this blessing that, that's given over the people of Israel. Um, this is what is spoken. The, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And so there are a number of times in scripture where you see this emphasis on the lordship of God and it, it comes in phases of three. We also see this not only in the Old, Old Testament as we're speaking to, but, but also in the New Testament, where the cry of the angelic host and, and the created beings that surround the throne of God, scripture says over and over and over again that the angels and created beings, they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And this, this, this 
statement, this repeated in, in you know, three different phrases, this is a nod to the Trinitarian God. This is the understanding that, yes, we worship God as one, but God is Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit. And so we see you know, these glimpses kind of littered throughout the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we see a few more times where um, there is more of an emphasis or more of an unveiling of God as Trinity. For instance, uh, in the opening chapter of Luke, the Bible says that the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and this is what he says. He says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the Holy Spirit, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, the Most High being God the Father. So the Holy One will be born to you, will be called the Son of God. So here in just two sentences, you have the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and God the Son found in Jesus Christ. If you remember reading through the Gospels when Jesus goes and he meets his cousin, John the Baptist, he meets him at the Jordan River. And we all know the story that John is going to baptize his cousin, but before he does it, John says, I dude, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. But nonetheless, Jesus says, no, this, this has to happen. And so John baptizes his cousin. Well, here we clearly see the Trinity revealed in this. The Bible says that as, the, as God the Son was dipped into the water, he comes up out of the water. God the Spirit descends upon him like a dove and then the Bible says that the voice of God the Father in heaven is spoken audibly where he gives his blessing to Jesus as son. And so in, in that scope, in that picture of the baptism of Christ, you see the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit there in, in one motion. Later in the Gospels, Matthew 28, uh, Jesus, as he has died on the cross for the sins of humanity, he's been buried, but then resurrected from the grave, he has conquered death, hell, and the grave. He, he walks the earth for a number of, of weeks, and then the Bible says that there comes a certain point where Jesus ascends into heaven before the eyes of the disciples. And as he is about to ascend in to heaven, this is what Jesus says. This is a, a commission that he gives, and we call it the Great Commission. The Bible says this, Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, obviously the three are mentioned there, but here, this is what's important to understand. He's talking in a plural phraseology. He's talking in plurality, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But notice what he says. He says, baptize them in the name of. When he uses the phrase in the name of, that is a singular statement. So in this, what you're hearing, he's saying, go to them and preach the gospel to them in the name of God, but in the name of God, in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's, it's a beautiful thing that, that we see Jesus right before he sends. He says this. Paul, later to the Ephesians, Paul would instruct them. He would say, um, for through him, in other words, through Jesus, we now have access to the Father by one Holy Spirit. The in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. So um, it's, it's through Christ that we have access to the Father um, by the Spirit, okay? So the triune God is here in the mix. Later uh, to the church at Corinth, this is what he would say. He said, the grace of the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God, the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So it's important to understand um, that, that all throughout scripture, this isn't something that just, you know, kind of evolved. This is uh, something that is documented all throughout scripture. Um, it, it, we, just, we just have to look for it. It's, it's hidden, like I, I like to say this term, it's hidden in plain sight. It's there for all of us to see and to understand, but there are times where we have to look for this uh, reality to, to come to fruition in our minds, okay? So the Trinity is a scriptural reality, 
Number three is important to understand that the Trinity is Orthodox Christianity, okay? I've heard people, bloggers and people on socials, uh, people who are um, not even Christians, atheists who are trying to debunk Christianity or whatever the case, and there is an argument that says that the, the, the concept or the idea of the Trinity was a later development uh, of the church that didn't come for, for hundreds of years after the resurrection of Christ. But, but I think it's important for us to understand um, that what I have just explained was written in the era of Jewish history. It, 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 the scriptures that I just read were not written well after, you know, 300 years after the resurrection of Christ. What did happen, though, is that many of the creeds of the church spoke to the, the nature of the Trinitarian God, and there was an emphasis there, okay? The creeds were just basically um, these, these written statements. They were summary statements of belief. You've got to understand that in much of Christian history, most Christians, the vast majority of Christians were illiterate. They could not read. Even, you know, as Paul and, and different gospel writers were writing their, their letters, it wasn't so that every person in the congregation could get a copy because the vast majority could not read. But they would find someone that could read and they would read the scriptures to the entire congregation so people could understand. And so the creeds were developed so that people could memorize and understand this is our statement of beliefs. These are the core things that we believe about God. And much of what is written in the creeds talks about God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so there are people that just kind of latch onto that and they say, no, this whole doctrine came from, um, you know, the, the Nicene Creed or, you know, the, the creeds that follow. That's, that's, not simply, that's simply not the case. The concept, the theological doctrine of the Trinity is embedded. It is rooted. It finds its origins in Scripture. The creeds are simply just affirming what the scripture already says. Um, the, the early church fathers, uh, you know, there, there are so many that can be named, but uh, Tertullian, uh, Augustine, Luther, uh, Ignatius, uh, Polycarp, uh, Justin the Martyr, all of these people spoke to, wrote about, and they embraced the concept of the Trinity. Um, it, is, it is an orthodox teaching um, that, that cannot be rejected. To reject the Trinity is to reject Jesus as God. And that's a lane that we just don't want to go down. So it's important for us to understand that, that the, the concept of the Trinity is, is buried in Scripture. It is, it is Orthodox Christianity, okay? Number four out of the things that I believe that every Christian should believe and understand about the Trinity is that the Trinity is not three gods, Okay, so now we're answering our original question, uh, do Christians worship three gods? Um, we do not worship three gods. That is what is called tritheism. We are monotheistic, mono meaning one, uh, theistic meaning God, okay? So if a person is monogamous, they are mono, they are in a relationship with one other person, okay? Okay. We are people that are monotheistic. We are in relationship with one God. This is not tritheism. Uh, Muslims uh, accuse Christians of, uh, of tritheism. That's the belief that God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three different gods. Uh, we don't believe that. As I've already stated in Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Jesus would emphasize that in the Gospels, that the Lord our God is one. Um, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, Paul said this. He said, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. Okay, so uh, Old Testament, New Testament, the, the concept that there is one supreme being, God, is what we believe and we embrace. We also believe that God is representative in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we would not say those are three individual gods. It is, he is one God. He is one supreme being. Um, it's not like Mount Olympus, you know, where up in heaven the gods come to gather and have discussions. Uh, that's not what this is. The, the Trinity 
is uh, there is a distinction of the persons, the roles and responsibilities we'll talk to later, but, but God is an inseparable being. There is no differentiation uh, of, of essence, of spirit, of, of togetherness. Um, so we do not embrace this idea of tritheism or that God is three gods, okay? Um, number five, I think that every Christian should understand that the Trinity is one being, three persons, okay? So this is where I'm going to dig in a little bit deeper to this idea because, again, I, w- I want to remind you, this is very confusing. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't make perfect logical sense to our finite mind. But once again, it's a very clear you know, position of, of the Bible. And so we must embrace it. But I'm going to dig down a little bit and, and hopefully help us to understand a little bit by using some examples and illustrations. But I want to read this, this quote to you by, by Mark Driscoll. He wrote in a book that he wrote on doctrine. It's a phenomenal book. Uh, but this is what he said. He said, God is one God, eternally existing in three persons. Each of the three shares fully the one divine essence. God is not simply unity, but eternally exists in rich, loving fellowship as the one and only God, okay? Um, There are those that would uh, suggest a a, a different form of, uh, of the Trinity. It's something that we call modalism. And this is the idea that God is one being and he kind of changes from the Father into the Son. And then at other times he'll change into the Holy Spirit. There are a couple of different lanes in which people think about this, but there are some that believe that, you know, when when Jesus came to earth, that basically God the Father transformed into God the Son, and so therefore heaven was vacant. That that there was no God in heaven, that God was on earth, and then when Jesus ascended into heaven, that he then changed modes or he transformed in the Holy Spirit, and now then he came to earth. Um, this is this is not scriptural. We do not believe this. Um, this is why we have to be careful when we're using illustrations to try to help people understand the Trinity. And and I'll give you an example of this. There are those that would say that. A man can represent God in this way, that a man is, can be a husband, but he can also be a father, but he can also be a brother, okay? And though I understand what they're trying to get at there, that there's one person that can be three different things, they're actually talking about modalism. Because what they're saying is that in one circumstance, this man may be a husband, but in another circumstance, he may be a brother, okay? Uh, That is not what we're saying about God. We're not saying that in one circumstance, he may be this or he may be that. Uh, God does not change forms. God is one being represented in, in, in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is a singular being expressing himself in these ways. He's not three different gods. Again, I, I understand there's mental gymnastics that go on with something like this, but I think it's something that the further we dig in and we begin to understand, uh, the more that we are comfortable with, with this concept. Um, there's a pastor in Tennessee, and or I guess he's retired now, but he's also an author. His name is uh, Ray Ortland, and um, I, I love a lot of the stuff that he writes. I think he has a very, um, he, he sounds theologically, but he, he's also deep and wide intellectually. And most of his stuff is well over my head, okay? Um, but he wrote out an illustration that I want to read to you that helps us at least get a little bit better understanding of this idea of one being and uh, as God, you know, became Christ in, in human form and all this. He writes it and he relates it to Lord of the Rings, okay? And so this is what he says. He writes, suppose just as Christ comes into his own creation at the incarnation, suppose that Tolkien had written himself into Middle-earth as a character 
of the story alongside Frodo and Mary and Pippin and all the rest. Had Tolkien done so, he would not for that reason cease to exist in Oxford, okay? In other words, they're saying if he was alive and living in Oxford, but wrote himself into the story of Middle Earth, he would not cease to exist in Oxford, okay? In fact, his whole existence in Middle Earth depends on his continued writing from Oxford. Nor has the unity of Tolkien's person been impaired, for one person can simultaneously be in Middle Earth and in Oxford, because they are not two different places within one realm, but they are two different realms altogether. Okay, so you understand He's comparing heaven and earth to earth and middle earth. And he's saying that God could write himself into his own story and not limit or affect negatively in any sense who he is because he's not trying to be in two places at one time. He's in two totally different realms at one time, okay? So in other words... It is one thing to be in Oxford and Cambridge at the same time, like in these two earthly locations at the same time, but it's a totally another thing to be in the Shire and in Oxford at the the same time. That's doable. Why? Because they're two different realms. And so as we ponder and we think about how could a, a triune singular God be in heaven, but also on the earth. And, you know, how does all this work out? Well, it's because we're thinking in our finite minds and we're thinking of heaven as a location in a similar way that earth is a location or Jerusalem is a location. And that's just not the case. They're two totally different realms. And in the same way that Tolkien could be in Oxford in the physical realm, he could also write himself into his narrative and it wouldn't affect either of those positions because he's writing in two different realms, okay? Anybody confused yet? Are we good? All right, we're good. So as we talk about God being one being, but three different persons, um, there are different roles that these three persons play out in the Godhead as we saw um, in the book of Genesis. Uh, We saw God the Father creating, the Spirit was hovering, but the the Son of God was the Word of God being spoken, the active agent. Um, We see that they're they're playing three different roles right there, but but it's one God, it's one Elohim, okay? Uh, For instance, uh, the roles of God the Father, um, He is the loving Father, okay? Um, He is, at least in our logical minds, the way it's written and outlined for us, in human understanding terms in the scripture, that as it relates to the Godhead, he is the head of the Godhead, God the Father, okay? Um, This is why you see Jesus saying to the Father, not my will, but your will, okay? So there was an active submission element there in that moment, and God the Father was the head in this triune being. Um, God the Father, he is the one that, that chose us from the foundations of the earth, okay? So there are certain things that God the Father is responsible to, to execute, but then there are certain roles that the Son fulfills. So just as God is the loving Father, Jesus is the beloved Son. He is the second member of the Trinity, and though God the Father chose us, it's Jesus Christ who redeemed us. It was his blood that was shed to redeem us, he was the, again, he was the active agent in our salvation, okay? The role of the Holy Spirit, um, he, is, uh, he is the third member of the Trinity, and while God the Father chooses us and Jesus Christ the Son redeems us, it's God the Holy Spirit who seals us for salvation, okay? So again, one being, three distinct persons, and they have distinct but yet unified roles with, within the Godhead, okay? So it's important for us to understand that uh, the Trinity is one being three persons. Um, I say, I use the term for us to understand very, very loosely because we can never 
possibly fathom what that really means, this side of heaven. Number six, I think it's also important for us to understand that the Trinity is co-eternal and co-equal, okay? What I mean when I say that the Trinity is co-eternal is I mean that God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God was never born. Okay, there wasn't a moment where God was created. There wasn't a moment where he opened his eyes for the first time. God has always been and God will always be. God will never die. He was, there was never a beginning of God. There will never be an end of God. God is different um, than, than any other being. We, we read about you know, the human soul. We realize that we will have everlasting souls, which means our souls, they will last forever right? But it's important for us to understand there was a beginning point for our souls. There was never a beginning point for God. He is, he is eternal. He, he has always been. Uh, angels and created beings, um, although they dwell in eternity, they are created beings. They had a beginning point. They may live forever. They may be everlasting like our souls are, but they are not eternal. God is the only being who is eternal. Um, Jesus, when it, when it comes to the nature of the incarnate son of God, Jesus um, did not become God, right? Like when he was born, he didn't just kind of evolve into God or, uh, you know, there's this teaching called adoptionism, which is the idea that Jesus, he was born as a regular person and he lived good enough and he was holy enough that God the father adopted him and he said, you know what? I'm going to make you God. Um, no, Jesus did not become God. He has always been God. He is eternal in that sense. Again, uh, John, in, in uh, his gospel, the opening chapter, he says this. He says, in the beginning was the word. He's speaking of Jesus. In the beginning, the word already existed. Okay, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him. So it's important for us to understand the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they are God, but, but there was, there's no beginning point for them, just like there's no end point for them. They are co-eternal. Um, to follow that, not only are they co-eternal, but they're co-equal, okay? Now, again, I know I just spoke in terms of, you know, in our human logic that God the Father is the head of the, the Trinity and Jesus is the second member and the Holy Spirit is the third member. Uh, I understand I, I spoke in kind of those terms, but as it relates to the Godhead in heaven, there, there's, there's equality there. there. There's no like distinction as far as levels of value or different. They are one essence. Um, there is a, a, a great photo I want to I want to show you here it has been used for just so long by theologians and this is how uh, seminary uh, seminaries try to help uh, pastors and and people understand uh, at least in part the nature of the Trinity um, this is called the, the 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 shield of the Trinity or the Trinity shield and it's the idea that God is one okay God is Father Son Holy Spirit Um. And what we understand is that God is Father, God is also Son, God is also Holy Spirit. But what we pull away from this is the idea, but the Father is, is not the Son. And the Son is not the Father, and the Father is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is, is not the Son. They are distinct in person, but they are one God. In one being, they share one divine essence. And again, I laugh because I know... I, I've just been through the, the mental just exhaustion of really trying to depict, and there are moments, it's so funny, there are moments where I will, I will sit and I will just be like, I get it, I find, like I understand, and then I will read one more sentence of scripture or a book I'm reading, and I'll just be like, I don't get it, I don't understand what's going on, you know, um, and and. Although some people would use that and to say, well, therefore, that's why you can't trust it because you can't understand it. But my argument and my response would be, I don't know that I want to serve a God that I am 
able, that I have the capacity to fully and finally understand. If that were the case, he would not be God. I would be God. And nobody wants that, okay? But, but God, it, it doesn't speak to the confusion. It doesn't speak to confusion. It speaks to majesty. It speaks to this idea that God is so other than what we can possibly imagine. And he has tried to communicate himself as father or, you know, in, in, the, in the incarnation of Jesus who walked as a human. He came to identify with us and help us to identify with him. But, but listen to me, there is always going to be a gap in that. We are never fully going to be able to identify with God because we are not God and we will never be God. And so therefore, there is going to be a gap in some of our understanding and in some of our knowledge. Um, so, so it's important for us to understand that, that the Trinity is uh, not only co-eternal, but also co-equal, okay? Number seven in your notes, it's important for us to, to try to understand that the Trinity is omnipotent, om- omniscient, and omnipresent, Okay, now for a quick just overview of these three statements, most of you are probably very familiar with this, but we believe that the Father, Son, Holy Spirit are all, again, one being. We believe that they are, that God, that he is all powerful over all things. He has all power over all things. Now, when Jesus became a human, there's this this argument that, you know, Christ, you know, um, you know gave up his divinity and he just became a human. We don't believe that. We believe that Jesus has always been divine. Um, But what we do believe is that he imposed self-limitations upon himself, okay? We believe that he set aside some of his divine attributes, some of his divine powers momentarily. Uh, We believe that's what he did in order to identify with us. So, So for instance, we believe that Jesus, there are times throughout the Gospels, Jesus needed to take a nap, okay? Uh, he, he felt weary at times. There was a, a exhaustion, a physical exhaustion where he needed sleep. Um, there were times where he experienced hunger or thirst. Those are very human qualities that you would never expect God would have, and, and he doesn't in that sense. But when God became man, he imposed those human limitations on himself so that he could experience that and identify with us uh, those things. So yes, we, but even in that state, we still believe that Jesus was, was all powerful. He could have chosen to pick up you know, everything that he had laid down in a moment. He even said, he said, don't you know that I could call on my father right now and a legion of angels would come right? Like I could command them with my authority and with my power and they could come because I'm all powerful and they would deliver me right now. But the will of the father be done. Okay. So he laid those things aside. He could have picked them up, but he was still all powerful. Um, He never exchanged his, his deity for his humanity. Okay. So we believe that the Trinitarian God is omnipotent. We also believe he's omniscient, meaning that God has perfect and complete knowledge of all things. Okay, uh, you've heard me talk a million times about this simple picture, and this is probably way too simplistic for what it actually is. But we believe that God lives outside of, outside of time and space; that God lives in eternity. Okay, um, but we believe that that time, if time and space were capsulized into a linear, you know, tube. God is outside of time and space. He is not bound by time. He's not bound by space. He is eternal and he operates here. And we believe that he's omniscient, meaning he knows all things, that he understands all things fully and completely because he's outside of time and space and he can see past, present, future, motive, heart, all of these kind of things because he is beyond that. He is so far outside of that. And we believe that's true of of the the Trinitarian God. And then finally, C, we believe that the Trinity is uh, omnipresent, which is just this idea that God is in every place in every moment. We believe in the same way that we believe God is here in this room tonight. We believe that God is also in Canada, in the wilderness tonight. We believe that God is on Mars tonight, okay? We, we believe that God is in all places at all times, being omnipresent. This is why we can cry out to God here tonight in the sanctuary and a church 
<coughs> excuse me, and a church over in Europe can cry out to God and they can experience the presence of God all the same because God is at all places at all times and in every moment, okay? And then finally, number eight is this. Uh, it's the idea that the Trinity is social, okay? Um, in your notes, it, it makes the statement that the Trinity is loving. So in the, in the relationship of the Godhead, um, there is this love that is bound. It's, it's, it's a divine love because their essence is one and intertwined, but there is a loving community that's there, okay? Uh, I've heard it said that before the world ever existed, before the cosmos ever existed, one thing that did exist was family. Before the first family, there was family in heaven in the Trinitarian God. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 17. He said, Father, you loved me before the creation of the world. So in other words, what he's saying, he's saying before the creation of the world and before the creation, the, the concept of family ever existed, you loved me as a son, as part of your family, there was a loving relationship. Um, I know that sometimes we, we, we make the statement that, well, you know, God was in heaven and although there were created beings and there were angels, that God kind of got lonely and so he created humans so that he could have fellowship with humans because he needed fellowship with humans. And uh, I, I know that that sounds novel and that sounds kind of, um, you know, hallmarkish that, that God needed us to have relationship with him. Um, but, but that, that is contrary to scripture. That is contrary to, to the essence of God. God needs nothing. God has never needed anything. God will never need us as valuable and as much, um, as, as much love and, and specialty as God places on us he doesn't need us. And I know that hurts us to some degree. I thank God that he doesn't treat us that way, but the harsh reality is that he has never needed us. Why? Because the Trinitarian God, there, there's a social element of love and completeness and fullness there that God has no need of anything. Michael Reeves, a, a modern day theologian, I classify him as a theologian, but uh, he's an author and writer. He wrote a book that was surrounded um, with the idea of the Trinity, I can't remember the name of it now, but this is a statement that he made. He said, the reason that everything exists that exists is because within the Godhead, there was so much love and so much pure devotion within that, that the love of God like, was, was not able to be contained and, and just overflowed from the Godhead. And, and the result of the love of God being overflowed was the creation of all things and, and love just began to overflow. And this is where humanity came from. Not because God had an experiment that he wanted to try out or he just got bored one day, but there was this overwhelming sense of love that, that spilled over and, and created all things that we know of today. So the Trinity is, there, there is a loving aspect within the Trinity. There's also a serving aspect within the Trinity, okay? Jesus is not less than the Father in being, but Jesus lovingly submits himself in his role, okay? So again, I want to go back to the idea of uh, when Jesus is in, in the garden. He says, Father, uh, take this cup from me. Like, I don't want to suffer. I know what's ahead of me. God, if there's any other way, Father, I don't want this to happen, but this is what he says. Jesus being God, he looked to the Father and he said, but not my will. In other words, not my human will, but thy will be done. So there was a submission. It doesn't mean that Jesus, you know, the son is less than the father. It just means that Jesus out of love chooses to serve his father in the same way that the father chooses to, to serve the son. I take us back to this idea of husbands and wives. Um, men and women are the same in value in the eyes of God. They are, they are equally precious. Men are not, you know, more valuable in the eyes of God than women are. Okay, uh, that is a societal thing. But I will say that men and women are different, and men and women, ordained by God, have different roles. Men and women were never created to be interchangeable and to fulfill, you know, 
one another's roles, that's not the way, that's also a, sh- a social construct. God has given certain offices to men that only men should do and certain offices to women that only women should do. That is the design, that is the nature of God. It doesn't make men or women less important or more important. It is simply a call to submit one to another, as Paul would write. He would say, submit one to another and serve one another out of love. It doesn't mean that you're less than or more than. That's not it. What it's about is serving one another in love. And we find this. This is why Paul said, you know, he related marriage. He said, this is kind of like a picture of of Christ in the church. He loves the church. This is the way husbands and wives should be. So the Trinity, uh, within the Trinity, there's an attitude of servanthood. There's also this idea of connectedness. I know I've mentioned this a couple of different times, but there is such an, uh, we can't even really articulate um, the, the interwovenness of, of the Godhead because, they are, because God is inseparable. It's not like you can, you know, chop up and distinguish these things. Uh, there, there is a word, it's called uh, perichoruses, but it's simply the idea that the three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are mutually indwell one another and they contain one another, which I like that language. They contain one another. Um, Augustine said it like this. <laughs> and this is, again, just, just try to follow the, the words here. This is what he says. Speaking of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said, each are in each and all in each and each in all and all are one. Okay, so what he's talking about here is he's saying that within the Godhead, they contain one another. There, there is no division within. They are, they are, they are so intertwined and indwell one another. There's no way to really understand. There's a connectedness that, that cannot be separated, okay? So as we, as we wrap this up, I think, I think it's just important to go back and to remind us that, you know, number one, do Christians worship three gods? No, we do not. We believe that God is of, of one being represented in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all of the same divine essence, okay? But I think, again, just to revisit, that the triune God is not understood by rationale. We should go as far as we can with our intellect as, as far as it relates to understanding God. But God is never fully understood by rationale, but he is to be embraced by faith. I think this is why the writer of Deuteronomy, Moses would be the one to pin this in chapter 29, verse 29. Uh, This is one of the things that I believe Moses is speaking to. and, And he wrote this, he said, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. And there are a number of things that, that we'll never fully understand, grace being one of those things. How could God, you know, execute grace and extend this to us? We can understand it in theory and, and even sense it in, in our being, but can we ever really thoroughly understand how or why God would do what he did or how it all played out in the supernatural realm, the spiritual realm? I don't, I don't think that we can. It's one of the secret things that belong to the Lord. And I think this understanding, this idea of the God as, as Trinity, I think it's one of the secret things that belong to the Lord. And I think I would agree with Maltman when he said this, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but this is what he said. He said, it's better to adore the mysteries of the Godhead than to investigate them. Now, I think we should investigate them, but man, it's better just to adore and just to say, Lord, you're, you're so beyond my comprehension. You're so beyond my intellect and what I could, you know, foster of one mental capabilities, capacities. But God, I just adore that you are so other that I can just look on you with majesty and appreciate all that you are and all that you say you are, even though I don't fully grasp it in my mind. We serve an awesome God. Amen. Amen. Amen.